Hi, and welcome back to Waveform Science. I'm Jeff Hagen. Tonight we're going to look at something a little bit different. Montech has sent us an advanced prototype of their X1200 power station that will be coming out in the next few months or so. Um, this is a 1200 watt hour lithium iron phosphate device with a 2000 watt inverter where the design philosophy is a little bit different. The philosophy behind this one is really, let's see how many features we can stuff in the box, uh, as opposed to sort of a minimum feature set that you might see from others. So this is more of a premium type device. As I said before, a 1200 watt hour battery that's uh, rated to uh, 2500 cycles to 80% uh, lithium iron phosphate, so you get the long shelf life. Uh, 2000 watt AC inverter at peak, and we will measure that of course. Uh, the DC side has every connector you can think of, with the uh, notable exception of the wireless charging pad is the only thing it doesn't have, but it has multiple of everything else, so that's real nice. Uh, it has battery expandability, uh, extra battery expandability in a 1200 watt hour device, which is really, really nice. Uh, it has a, a impact resistant and wa semi water resistant case. Uh, the prototype unit does not have ratings on those, but we'll do some testing on that as well. Um, and overall, uh, it's a very energy dense device for the size factor. So first off, uh, let's take a look at what came in the box. Uh, now I will call out ahead of time, of course, this is a prototype unit. Um, what came in the box for me is my ear <laughs> may or may not be the same stuff that comes in the box for the retail units. So we'll take a look at what's in there because uh, they sent me this uh, battery connection cable uh, to attach the, ex the extra battery. And the extra battery, by the way, you won't see in this video because it was damaged in shipping, so that has to get fixed and then sent back. UPS is what it is. Uh, there'll be a video on that later, once it's back and, and working. Um, we have the uh, solar charging cable um, with the uh, Weepoo connectors that are becoming very popular and common. Uh, we have a cigarette lighter cable. And we have a very thick, very beefy AC power cable. Um, no charging brick here, yay. So let's get through it. Let's take a look at what this device does and see how it behaves. The Montec X1200 weighs in at 36.6 pounds, according to my scale. That is actually a little bit different than what the manufacturer stated in their data sheet. Uh, they said 35 pounds, so I've got an extra pound and a half somewhere. Assuming I go with my measurements, that gives me an energy density by weight of 35.2. The dimensions of the X1200, according to my tape measure, work out to uh, about 20 and a half by about 16-ish if I include the handle. And the side dimension, nice and thin here, works out to about four and a half inches. Uh, manufacturer says for this one, 20.2 uh, by 15.7 by 5.2, right about what I measured with my tape measure. That gives me 0.95 cubic feet of volume. By the way, for a uh, 1280 watt hour battery, that is one of the best I've measured. Um, 1,341 energy density by volume. That's where you take the uh, capacity of the battery and divide, divide it by the volume to see how, how packed in they've got the cells. So that's actually really good. The exterior of the Montec X1200 appears to be designed to carry around like a briefcase. They've got a handle on the top here. Actually, really comfortable handle to carry it around with for the weight. Um, and I've spoken with the manufacturer, unlike other solar generators, this can actually be used in multiple positions. So you can use it this way, up like this, or um, you can put it down on the side and uh, use it this way. Uh, it is not recommended to put it on this side, with this side facing down, because all of the components interiorly are actually bolted down to the back of the case here but it is designed to be used up on its side. So let's take a look at what, what ports and connectors they have on each side. The front face of it has nothing except the logo. There's no connectors on this side at all. Uh, one side, we've got an AC output, uh, which interestingly is used if you connect two of the units for split phase power. Um, if I open this up, we've got um, 
two pins plus several data pins. So that's going to be used for split phase, not for actual AC output. Uh, we've got an AC on out switch. So AC on and off, that turns on and off the inverter. Uh, we've got a door here that's got two panels. To open the door, you have to pull down both panels simultaneously and pull the door open. Inside the door, we have three uh, NEMA 520 AC outlets. And in addition to the AC outlets, we have a little area here that's, by the way, the fan output. But also, you can actually put the uh, charging power cable in this area. It makes it easier to carry around. Close up the little door. Let's look at it from the bottom here. The back of the unit has uh, nothing, just a sticker that's got the uh, specs printed and uh, all of the uh, regulatory approvals from everybody that's approved it. And moving on to the next side, we have again uh, the main power button. Uh, there's not a separate DC on and off on this unit, by the way. Uh, the main power button turns on the DC outputs. Uh, and then we've got a second power button on the other side for the AC. So when it's on, DC outputs are always on. Uh, we've got a 12 volt 30 amp port. Um, this is using the same airline connectors that are very common across this industry. This is a two pin jack. And we've got another door. Pull the door open. On this side, we have a regular input for computer power cable. We have your 12 volt cigarette lighter socket. Uh, we have two uh, 100 watt USB C ports. We have two 60 watt USB C ports. We have two quick charge ports and we have two 12 volt 5521 jacks. In other words, we are in DC power heaven. Um, we can power all kinds of fun stuff uh, from this. This has all the DC outputs you'd probably ever want anytime in the near future. This is very, very well put together for a unit of this size. All kinds of ports. I'm very, very happy with that. Uh, we're going to test these in just a moment. Now, if I look at the top of the device, or the front, depending on which uh, orientation we want to put it in. Let's put this down at the side here. As you can see, when you lay it flat, it is pretty flat. Um, we've got the screen on the front, and the screen turns on when you push the power button. There's our screen. We've got some information. We're going to go through the screen in more detail in just a moment. Uh, and on the front of it, you've got two more connectors. You've got one for an external battery. So this unit is expandable with extra batteries. Um, Montec will have them available. And you can plug in multiple of them. I don't have details on exactly how many right now. Again, this is a uh, industrial prototype. So we'll see how many that winds up being supported. But you, it's definitely expandable, which is very cool. Uh, we've also got the input on the front here for the solar panels. This is, again, a uh, standard airline connector that's being used across the industry. This is a particular one is a two-pin connector. Okay, let's take a look at the screen on the Montec X1200. So the screen itself is on, the, I guess, the top of the case next to where the handle is, underneath the handle itself. So you have kind of a size limitation on how big this screen can be based on just the physical size of the handle itself. So the screen itself is pretty small. Um, we're looking at about two inches wide. Uh, maybe about an inch and three quarters tall. So pretty small. That said, it gives you all the information you need. Let's turn it on and as it powers up, look in the upper right hand corner. You're going to see a uh, Bluetooth icon that then later, if it decides to connect to my Wi-Fi network, is going to turn into a Wi-Fi icon right there. There we go. So this unit does have both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Directly below that, we've got the uh, time remaining in minutes, uh, 8,351 minutes, if you were to just leave it on. Um, I have asked the manufacturer, and they have agreed that it is probably better to have hours and minutes instead of just minutes, so that we don't have to do math. Uh, next, it's got the uh, output states from the DC. Remember, the DC side does not have a power button, so as soon as you turn it on, the DC side is on. Uh, you've got the state of charge of the battery, and you've got the uh, temperature sensor. Uh, yay, you can actually read the temperature out of the device. Very nice. Um, if you put power input to it, you turn on some AC power. It's going to detect the AC power and tell you how many watts are coming in. 
in this case it should start charging at relatively fullish speed in a minute or so. Uh, next, if I'm going to give it some solar power. Some solar here, there we go. It's going to detect the solar power. Oh, by the way, and the reason it's not charging from AC is I forgot I have it set to PV priority mode, which we will cover later. So it's normal that it's not charging right now. Uh, next, I can give it some solar, and uh, it's going to tell you how many watts it's charging from, and the time to recharge. Notice the time to recharge is on the opposite side from the time to discharge. It's only going to show one of the two. Uh, and it will show you if the fan is on or not. That's on the input side. On the output side, uh, you can see your AC loads. I've just turned on the AC inverter right down here. And I have just some light bulbs plugged into it. Uh, ye old school light bulbs. So I'm pulling uh, 212 watts uh, just as a demo here. And that's your AC output and your DC output. Turn that on here. I just have a load tester plugged into the cigarette lighter port. And right now I'm pulling 108 watts out of my load tester. So that's what you wind up seeing on the uh, on the screen. Oh, uh, by the way, if you do have AC input uh, and output at the same time and you're not in PV mode, uh, there is a AC uh, UPS mode built into here as well that we're going to cover later in the video. Next, let's go through the options that are in the Montec. So the uh, app isn't done yet. Um, there is a, a preview version of the app that we'll see later, but the, that version has no way to control the options. So there, there is a way on the device itself to set the various options to kind of give us an idea of what this device is going to support. In order to do that, to set the options, um, you need to have the device powered on like this. Um, or excuse me, you have to have it powered off. Turn it off here and you have to give it power. Have it be in this mode right here. And then you hold down the inverter button for about 10 seconds. Then we get a little menu. So the options that we have here now, by the way, to change this, to change an option, you would just tap it to change the option and you press and hold like that to select the next option. So the options that we have available are AC and DC auto off. Uh, that's a timer. Um, you can set it to how long you want to have it turn off for. You can set it for anywhere between one and 12 hours. Uh, the AC frequency, you can set it 60 hertz or 50 hertz. Please don't ever pick 50 hertz in the US. You can set the brightness of the screen. Interestingly, the screen does not have a timeout. It simply has a brightness. Uh, you can turn it down if it's too bright, but it won't turn off on its own. Uh, low power reminder. Uh, it's going to make a beeping noise like you're hearing right now uh, when it gets down to that level. So it will remind you that it's going to go dead before it does. Uh, you can set the car input power maximum. So if your car has an 8 amp cigarette lighter, which most of them do, uh, you'd set it to 8 amps. If you have a 10 amp cigarette lighter, you could set it to 10 amps and get an extra 2 amps of charging out of it. Uh, it works out to it 12 volts. An extra 2 amps is uh, 24 watts. So not a huge difference, but it's a nice to have. Uh, AC charging rate would be the next one. Excuse me, it just timed out. AC charging rate you can set the percentage of the maximum rate at which it will charge, which the maximum rate is uh, changing my car power input here. But uh, your AC charging rate uh, maximum is 1,000 watts. You can set it lower. Charge end. Uh, that will set it such that it will not fully charge to 100%. You could set the maximum to 80 or 70 or whatever you'd like. Discharge end, uh, same thing, that sets the minimum. So it will hard power off with an error, uh, basically saying battery dead at 0%. Uh, if you want to reserve 10 or 15% of the battery, you could turn that up. Uh, by the way, all of the discharge testing that I have done has this set at 0. Uh, AC and DC always on, that automatically turns on the AC or the DC outputs um, when the unit first turns on, uh, on either AC or DC. And you can set that in the menu itself. Uh, PV priority, as I said before, I have it set to PV priority at 50%. When it's set to PV priority, it will prefer to charge off of solar um, 
below that number. So let's say you have both solar and AC plugged in. It'll prefer solar um, below 50%, but above 50% it will only do solar. So even if you have AC plugged in, it's going to ignore that AC and just charge off solar. Very useful feature. You can set your temperature units to Celsius Fahrenheit. You can turn on and off the buzzer. And the last one, if I can get back into the menu again without it timing out, is up here at the top, we've got a cycle counter. And you can see during my testing, I've put 42 cycles on this battery, and the battery health is 100%. Useful little tidbits that you don't tend to see from other manufacturers. DC output port testing. This is one of the examples of a uh, slightly different design philosophy at Montec. Uh, here we have all of the DC output ports, um, as many as we can think of. So first off, they have the ubiquitous 12-volt uh, cigarette lighter socket. Most 12-volt cigarette lighter sockets are rated between 8 to 10 amps. Uh, Montec decided to use a 20-amp rated port, so we're going to be able to pull more power through this than you can pull through most of them. Uh, it sits at 13.6 uh, volts resting when you're not pulling any power from it, 13 volts when you're pulling 8 amps from it, 12.9 uh, when you're pulling 10 amps, and I got all the way up to 19 amps with my tester, uh, and then realized that my tester is actually not rated for that much power, and then back to back off. So I didn't get all the way up to the full 20 amps, simply because I don't have the equipment to do it. Uh, but yeah, um, definitely a 20 amp port. Very nice. Uh, next, you will see there are two USB-C ports at the top. These are 100 uh, watt rated ports. They test out at my tester as 100 watt rated ports. And you can pull 100 watts from both of them simultaneously. Next below it, we have two ports that are marked 65 watts. These test out on my tester as 65 watt ports, and you can pull 65 watts out of both of them simultaneously. Uh, next up, we have two quick charge ports. Uh, these are again over spec ports. Most quick charge ports are 18 watt ports. These are actually 24 watt ports. So most of your cell phones that have a fast charging feature aren't gonna charge that fast anyway. Uh, but some of your tablets, uh, specifically a few of the Samsung tablets, can charge faster with a 24-watt port than an 18-watt port. So uh, this does test out as, an, as a 24-watt port, uh, and you can pull 24 watts from both of them simultaneously. Uh, below those, we have the two 5521 barrel jacks. These are 12 volts each. Uh, they're rated at 5 amps per port, and you can pull 5 amps from each one simultaneously. Uh, next, uh, we have over here on the side, I'm going to unscrew the connector. Uh, we have a 12 volt 30 amp port. Positive and negative, gives you 30 amps of output. And uh, here you can see that I am pulling uh, 300 watts from that port. So, absolutely can do the job. Alright, next we're going to take a look at the app for the Montec X1200. And by the app, uh, this is a prototype unit, the app isn't ready yet. However, this device does follow a standard communication protocol. Uh, it's using either Tuya or Smart Life, um, whichever you prefer. Uh, this is an interesting protocol to be following because this protocol is primarily used for um, home integration devices, uh, things like door switches and buttons that turn on and off lights and uh, Wi-Fi light bulbs, things like that. Um, it's one of the more common standards so it's relatively easy to find devices that know how to talk to this. Um, many of these devices are uh, Google Home or Apple HomeKit certified in addition to being Tuya. So you can find those as well. So it follows that standard. That being said, um, the, the customized app isn't ready. So what I'm going to be showing you is the, uh, the apps from, directly from Smart Life that knows how to talk this protocol. Um, and this UI does not represent the UI of the finished device, but it does show you what it can do. So first off, I have a power station here that is, uh, th that's paired. This is the X1200. We're going to go in there. And in here, I can read out the battery percentage, uh, the remaining time, uh, 333 minutes. Um, I can see the current temperature in Celsius instead of Fahrenheit, but that's fine. That's the same data. Um, I can see the, uh, the voltage, uh, that's coming out of the inverter. I can see the AC wattage, and I can see something called AC output set that is just set to zeros. I'm not entirely sure what that is. Uh, there's also two switches, so I'm going to 
flip off one of the switches. There's switch one and switch two, so let's turn off switch number one. Uh, the switch number one appears to be the AC inverter. And you can see on the screen of the device here that the AC inverter is turned off. Let me turn it back on. And the inverter turns back on. Seems to work just fine. Uh, switch number two is interesting. Um, switch number two turns off the DC side. And you'll remember that I said earlier that there is no physical button anywhere in the device that turns off the DC side. But you can turn it off independently uh, via the app. So, interesting. You can turn it off, turn it back on. Works the same as any other app. Um, as I said before, this is a both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi enabled unit. So you should be able to control this from anywhere you have network, assuming it is on a Wi-Fi network itself. AC charging rate test. How fast does it want to charge off wall power? So what I've got here is I've just got the X1200 sitting on a table. It's plugged into an extension cord, which I can turn on and off, and we're just going to see how fast it charges. Flipping the power on, it's going to detect AC power right down here. It's going to tell us our charging watts. Fan kicks on right away when it starts. As I said earlier, that's something they're working on. And it charges at a little over a thousand watts. Uh, interestingly, when I measure this in a graph, which I've done before, um, it's displaying a thousand watts on the screen, but it's actually pulling a little bit less than a thousand watts from the wall. So there's kind of a sensor discrepancy issue there, probably because it's a prototype unit. Uh, there are selectable charging rates in the uh, in the menu, as you saw earlier. So I decided to measure three different rates. I picked the 100% rate, the 80% rate, and the 50% rate. Uh, I allowed the device to fully cool before each of the charging tests to make sure it wouldn't overheat and slow down on its own and halfway through. And it pulls, uh, as measured from the wall, a little bit less than 1,000 watts at, a, at the 100% rate and takes uh, an hour and a half-ish to charge. Uh, at the 80% rate, it uh, pulls about 750-ish watts from the wall, uh, which makes sense. Uh, math. <laughs> And it takes two hours to charge. And at 50% rate, uh, it pulls uh, a little bit less than 500 watts from the wall and uh, takes a little over three hours to charge. Again, makes sense. Uh, the charger in the Montec is about 90% efficient, which means it pulls about 10% more power from the wall than it puts into the battery, which also makes sense because the power, the fan is running, something's turning into heat. That's something that's turning into heat is power, so that's where the extra power goes. So 90% efficient, that's about average. Um, I don't see a lot of charging that's much more efficient than that, so I can't really really say anything bad about that. And these, the different charging speed settings are actually really handy because let's say you want to charge this off in your car off a 1,000 watt inverter. Well, a 1,000 watt inverter, almost all of them can't do a 1,000 watts all the time. Um, they can do a 1,000 watts for you know 80% duty cycle, so you've got to really slow it down to about 800 watts to keep your inverter from overheating, even if it's a 1,000 watt rated inverter. The setting in this device allows you to set basically whatever charging rate you want, because you can set a percentage of the full charging speed, uh, where the full charging speed is about 1,000 watts. So if you want to set it down to uh, 750 watts of charging, that's actually pretty easy to do. So yay on Montec for that. Solar charging. So how fast does the X1200 pull power from your solar panels at various different voltages? So my experimental setup here, I have my big DC power supply. Uh, this is a 1 volt to 150 volt at 33 amps, also known as 5000 watt power supply, which is way more power than the Montec is going to pull anyway, so we can see how much it's going to pull at its maximum rate. The output of that power supply is going into this DC circuit breaker that lets me turn it on and off, currently in the off position, and that's going around into the solar input cable on the Montec itself. So when the experiment starts, we're actually going to have the Montec turned off, which you can see on the screen here it is in fact turned off, because we want to make sure that it turns on on its own uh, when the sun comes up in the morning if you've got it plugged into solar panels overnight. Um, it should, and we'll see. In fact, it does. Uh, we are at 49% uh, charge, and uh, we just finished the max rate charge test a minute ago, so we are warm. It is at uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit internally. So at uh, 12 volts, which is their minimum, uh, we're pulling uh, about 6 amps. 
and let's bring the voltage up to regular car voltage. 13.8 volts roughly. I'm going to pull 8 amps at 13.8 volts. Uh, let's get it up to, oh, right there. So right around 15 volts is where it jumps up. And it wants to pull quite a bit more power after that level. So one thing to be aware of, um, if you have a 24-volt car and you want to charge it off a 24-volt car, it is going to try to pull 22 amps, which is way, way too much for a car cigarette lighter port. So if you've got a 24-volt car, you're going to have to hardwire it to the battery if you want to charge off your car. It'll, it will charge. It's just going to pull 22 amps. There's no problem with that. So let's keep going up in voltage. Let's get up to about 19 volts. That's your standard solar, solar panel voltage for a single panel. And at this point, we are pulling uh, 22 amps and we are pulling uh, 397 watts. Uh, one other thing to note, by the way, um, some MC4 connectors, especially the really cheap ones on Amazon, they're only rated for 20 amps. Uh, this is pulling 22. You're going to want to get the more premium MC4 connectors that are rated for higher wattages, or excuse me, higher amperages, uh, because we're pulling more than 20 amps. Okay, let's uh, keep going up in power here. Get up to about 23 volts. And we're still pulling 22 amps, 22.6 amps, and 483 watts of charging. So you can get almost 400, almost 500 watts of charging off of uh, one single panel at 22, uh, 22 volts. Let's get up to about the 36 volt range. Now we're starting to get into the residential panel size. And we're now charging at 770 watts. Um, so that's going to be bigger than any single residential panel. So you're definitely going to be able to max out a single residential panel uh, from, from the Montec. Uh, let's go up to about 50 volts. And the fans start to kick on a little bit. 50 volts is about the limit of a single panel voltage. You don't see too many pa single panels over 50 volts. There's the fans have kicked on. Uh, we're now charging at 1,000 watts and pulling the full 22 amps. So uh, you could, if you wanted to max this out, uh, get two solar panels at uh, uh, 50 volts per panel, put them in parallel because those are usually 10 amp panels. And then you're going to have 20 amps and you're almost going to be getting 1,000 watts out of it. So you're still going to max out those panels, even if they're in parallel, uh, all the way up to 50 volts. That's very nice. Let's keep going up. And there we go. We've hit the maximum here. You can see as I go up in voltage, that my current is dropping. That's because we're above the max wattage. This is going to charge at about 1200 watts maximum. So as your voltage gets higher, you don't need as much current to hit the maximum. So let's get up to about 80 ish. What are we pulling at 80? At 80, we're still pulling 16 amps. Let's get up to 90. Now we're pulling 14 amps, 100 volts. This does go up to 150, 100 volts, uh, 12 amps, 110 volts. And the fan is really kicking on in this unit now. It's really screaming. 10.6 uh, amps at 120. And there we go, right around 130, which is where I was expecting. That's when we get below 10 amps. So if you have 10 amp solar panels, you're going to want to be at least above 130 volts in order to max it out. Uh, but you don't want to be too much above 130 volts because then if it gets below freezing, solar panels make extra voltage above freezing and you're going to overload the unit. So the max on here is 150. Let's get up to the max. And there we go. Right at 150, it cuts off to zero. And it's beeping. So it's telling me that I've got an overload. It's got a little red warning on the screen and it's pulling no power. If I back it off, does it start charging on its own? Does it want to charge on its own? There we go. It takes it a minute, but it does in fact start charging on its own if it backs off. So 
don't purposefully build a solar array that's too big. Let me turn this off here. Don't uh, purposefully build a solar array that's too big, obviously, because you don't want to overload it on purpose. But if it does get overloaded momentarily, it will start again. Um, I will, by the way, point out the amount of noise here. Um, the fans are quite noisy. Uh, I'm not going to do a specific sound level test in this video because uh, Montec has told me that one of the things they are fixing between the prototype unit and the production unit is the fan noise. So there isn't a lot of point to show you a sound level test when I, we already know it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. It's not quiet. Um, but they're going to fix it between now and the production model. So showing you the measurements on the version of the product that they're not selling isn't interesting. So we're, we'll skip that one. But yeah, no, solar panel test. Um, uh, basically, this is going to be real easy to build an array for to max it out. Because you can max it out all the way down to about 50 volts. And that's real nice. So if you get whatever panels you can get, there will be a way to arrange those panels such that you can max out the device, assuming you have enough panels to actually max it out, if you can get above 50 volts. Dual charging test. Does it charge any faster with both AC input and solar input than it would charge with just solar input or just AC input? So let's try it. First off, I've got it plugged in here. I'll turn on my AC input. See how fast it charges. We are at 54% charge. It's detecting the input and it's going to start pulling power. Give it a second here. And we are charging right about a thousand watts from AC input. Let's give it solar input. Turn on my uh, DC circuit breaker here. Now it's detected the solar. I've got it at 55 volts. That should be enough to max it out. And it is detecting. There we go. So it will charge a little bit faster to in total uh, from solar and AC. However, it seems to prefer the AC because you can see I've got AC power here going at a thousand and solar, which this, this device has way more than three amps available. I can pull 33 amps out of here. It's just only pulling 200 watts out of here. So it seems to prefer AC, which is a little odd. Let me kick the AC off. See if the solar goes faster. It should. So if I unplug it from AC, it seems to... There we go. Now it's kicked on. Now I've got 1,200 watts of DC coming in. Let's kick the uh, AC back on. It has completely stopped charging from solar. So, yeah, if you try to dual charge it, it's going to prefer AC as opposed to charging off DC, which is a very strange choice. Um, maybe just a prototype thing? Not entirely sure here. Uh, but either way, uh, kind of an odd decision. AC and DC efficiency testing. Like most solar generators, I took the Montec, charged it up, and then discharged it, and then charged it up, and discharged it at a bunch of different wattages through a bunch of different means in order to figure out the efficiency across the discharge curve. And I say discharge curve because discharge efficiency is not a constant across loads. When you have smaller loads, your discharge efficiency goes down. So let's take a look at that graph. Um, at On the AC side, we start out at a glorious 24% at 7.5 watts, which actually sounds bad, but is completely normal. Um, at that wattage level, the standby power of the inverter tends to dominate the graph. Because, one, why would you run a 7.5 watt load off AC for two days? But that's exactly what I did. I ran a 7.5 watt load, and it ran for one day and 22 hours. Um, all of these timing numbers on the graph, by the way, these are all measured uh, these are not estimates. I, I filled it, then I emptied it, and I let, let it drain. That's how long it took. Uh, maximum AC efficiency was at 87% at 1,000 watts. Took an hour and seven minutes to do that. On the DC side, we actually have a really big uh, DC bus here because we've got this 12-volt, 30-amp bus. That's going to give me about 300 watts. And then in addition to that, you've got the USB ports. So I was able to pull uh, 300 watts from the 30 amp port and an additional 200 watts, 100 watts per port, from the 100 watt uh, USB-C ports, giving me uh, 500 watts. And I, in theory, could have pulled more. I could have hooked up some more testers to the 65 watt uh, outputs, but I kind of decided to stop there. 
So uh, peak efficiency at the DC side was actually at 200 watts, uh, five hours and 32 minutes for it to discharge fully. Uh, very, very good numbers. The DC side on this unit is all kinds of impressive. Uh, they didn't quite get as good of efficiency on the DC side as on the AC side, the peak efficiency. 86% um, versus 87%. Um, somewhat surprising because most units, the DC side is more efficient than the AC side. Uh, could very well be because it's a prototype and they just haven't uh, optimized things yet. Uh, we'll see when the uh, final unit comes out. Uh, but overall, uh, very good showing for efficiency numbers from Montec. In this next test, we are going to confirm that the Montec X1200 has a UPS mode, and we're going to take a look at how it is that it works. So first off, I have the device. I don't even have the inverter turned on right now. So let's go ahead and turn that on. We have the oscilloscope up here. This is monitoring the output of the inverter. So that's good. We've got power coming out of it. That's all good. This guy over here, this is an amp meter monitoring the power input coming from the wall. Right now that's at zero because I have the switch turned off. Nothing is actually flowing. Let's go ahead and turn that switch on. You'll see down there I've got an AC input turned on on the display of the Montec right here. And here we're going to see some power start to flow in. We're going to come up to about 10 amps and it shows a thousand watts of charging up on the screen. Very nice. Next, I'm going to turn on a load device. Let's actually put some AC load on here. Oh, the other thing to notice, the uh, oscilloscope, notice the power got messier. Uh, this is PG&E at night. It's all kinds of messy. So it's passing through my grid power. Let's turn on some load devices. All right, now we've got the load device on. We're pulling 800-ish uh, watts. And you can see I'm pulling more power. Now I'm up to 15 amps being pulled from the wall. It still says UPS mode down here, and it has lowered my charging speed from 1,000 watts down to 800 watts. That's a very good thing. That's kind of what we're expecting. Let's give it some more load. Now, when I kick this load on, you can see my AC output goes up to 2,200 watts. The AC input goes to zero. And I'm going to slowly back this load off a little bit. When we get back down below, my meter turned off. When we get back down below 15 amps, it starts pulling power from the wall again. But when we go above 15 amps, let me turn on some more load here so you guys can see. When I get above the amount of power that an AC wall outlet can handle, my input power from the wall goes to zero. It islands itself and it just runs off the battery. So at this point, it's got power coming into it. It's got 1900 watts of load. And despite the fact that it has a power input going into it, it's not doing any charging of the battery, and it is still running directly off the inverter. And if I lower the load back down to below what an outlet can handle, you can see now we're pulling 15 amps of power again, and we're right at the limit, so we're not even doing any charging. We're just passing all that power straight through. If I turn that load, if I turn one of my bigger loads off, you'll see that we actually start doing some charging again. So now we've gone back to battery charging and we are charging. So why does it work this way? Um, I talked with the company that makes this and their representatives told me that this was a choice uh, based on whether or not they wanted to have a bi-directional inverter where the inverter is the actual thing doing the charging uh, or if they wanted to have separate charging circuits. And as you saw at the beginning of this video, this, this unit has a very good energy density. In other words, it's a very small unit for the amount of battery that's in here. This is a trade-off. So if you're going to be running this frequently, where you're, you want to be plugged in and you want to be on UPS mode, and in addition to being on UPS mode, you want a grid charge uh, with a load higher than your wall outlet can handle, understand that this unit is not going to grid charge while the load on the unit, the AC load, is higher than the amount of power that an AC wall outlet can handle. But at the same time, it is not going to overload the AC wall outlet, so it is perfectly safe to put more power than you can pull out of an AC wall outlet on this device. It won't, won't overload the outlet, but it simply will not charge the battery when it's in that state where it's pulling too much power from the inverter that it can't pass it through from the wall outlet. In this test, we're going to measure two things. First off, the uh, maximum power output of the inverter on the Montec, 
And the second thing we're going to look at is the cleanliness of said power coming out of the device. For the cleanliness test, I've got the, uh, of course, the oscilloscope, so we can look at the waveform. Uh, but it's very difficult to compare multiple devices across each other just by looking at waveforms. So what we're going to do instead of that is I have this device, which is set up to read total harmonic distortion. Total harmonic distortion is the percentage of my waveform that is not a 60 hertz waveform. So most of your power that comes from the power company um, is going to be somewhere in the 5% to 8% range, where 5% is considered the target. So you can see here I've turned on my loads where it's uh, 1700 watts on this inverter, and we're all the way down to 2%, so that's nice and clean. I'm going to go ahead and add some additional load. We'll see how much load we can add to it before it gives up, and we'll see where the harmonic distortion is as it gives up. So let's add in some more load here. We are at 1691 watts. And I'm going to really slow turn this up. Okay, now we're up at uh, 2100 watts. Still 2.7%. Let's go up to 2200 watts. There we go. That's the rated maximum for this device. 2300 watts, 3%. 2400 watts, 2500%. 2600%, 3.5%. We jumped up to 3200 watts. That's way over the maximum. And we're sort of stabilizing at uh, 28. There we go, finally overloaded. So we got all the way up to 3200 watts, and then I pulled it back and we went down to 2800 before it signaled overload. And we were at a very reasonable harmonic distortion rate, definitely below the 5% target throughout the entire test. So, excellent job on that, Montek. Our next test, we're going to test the UPS mode function to figure out how quickly the power switches. All of these solar generators have what is called an offline UPS mode. What offline UPS means is the battery is sitting effectively on a shelf as power is flowing through the device in UPS mode. So the power is coming in through the input, going straight to the output, the battery is basically not involved. The uh, inverter is spun up because it takes a while to start an inverter. So it's spun up and it's ready to go, but there's no power coming out of it. When the power goes out, it detects that the power has gone out and quickly switches over to the inverter. That means that there's a switching time that's not zero, um, where your devices have weird and or no power. And that's actually not a problem because the devices in the United States, the spec is that a device can, should be able to handle a no power situation for up to 20 milliseconds. So as long as the switch time is shorter than 20 milliseconds and you're running some kind of a standard device that can handle it, there's no problem. So here's the experimental setup. So first off, I have my oscilloscope sitting here. Uh, this is a battery powered oscilloscope. There's no power plug plugged into this running off battery. Because if you're trying to measure mains power and you have your oscilloscope running off mains power, you have a problem. You, you, you'll blow up your scope basically or zap the heck out of yourself. On this side, I have an attenuator that is running to the mains power output, the AC output, on the X1200. Uh, you always want to use an attenuator, otherwise you'll just blow up the scope. Um, they can't handle 120 volts. So this is going to get my 120 volts down to about 19-ish volts, which the scope can handle just fine. On my other side here, I have this going into a wiring block, and the other side of my wiring block has the cheapest USB adapter I could find on Amazon. Uh, I specifically want a cheap one because I want it to not have any capacitors in it so that it has the power go out faster. I also have a load device, a, a load tester, on the same wiring block to cause the voltage to go down even faster because I want to get that voltage down fast enough that I can take a snapshot. The oscilloscope is set to take a snapshot when the voltage coming out of the USB adapter, which is normally 5 volts, gets below 2 volts. So as the power fails, it's basically going to take a picture of what my AC waveform looks like. And then I can do some measurement on that picture to see how fast it actually switched over. Let's go ahead and run that test. All right, so at this point we've got the Montec is plugged in, it is charging, we have the load turned on, the oscilloscope is set up to ready to go into capture mode. Let's put it in capture mode. 
and let's flip the switch and there we go. So you can see that it was on grid power, sort of ugly looking PG&E power, and then we uh, flipped the switch and we got to a much cleaner looking uh, power coming out of the inverter. So let's actually measure this and see how long it took. So I'm going to take my cursor, I'm going to set its time, I'm going to set my A side here to right about where it started having problems, probably right about there. I'm going to set my B side here to when it started recovering, right about there. So A to B right here is 10.4 milliseconds. 10.4 milliseconds is absolutely fast enough. So very nice. So anything you're going to plug into this, uh, short of, you know, extremely sensitive scientific equipment, anything you're going to plug into this that's normal kind of gear is not going to have any trouble whatsoever with power going out or power coming back on. Next, we're going to run the 48-hour UPS mode test. The purpose of this test is to make sure that the device is stable when running under UPS mode when it's backing up a critical load. In this particular case, we have it plugged into power. Uh, in other words, the UPS mode is turned on. And it's passing through a load of about 150 watts consistent. And what I mean by consistent is the load is not changing. It's not turning on and off. It's 150 watts the whole time. And we let this run for a full 48 hours uh, while it's being video recorded to make sure that nothing weird happens. Additionally, you can see on top of the X1200, I have a meter hooked up to it. This is a recording voltmeter, and it's going to take a recording. Uh, we'll have a thousand data points over 48 hours. You guys can figure out the timing. And it's going to monitor the voltage coming out to make sure we don't miss it accidentally turning off. As you guys can see on the chart, the voltage is kind of all over the place. <laughs> But um, it's not the fault of the X1200. It's passing through power from my local utility, Pacific Gas and Electric. And they are somewhat notorious as being, uh, shall we say, not the best utility out there. So the voltage uh, at the bottom of the graph to the top of the graph, 114 volts to 126 volts, that is legit voltage for North America. So despite the fact that you can see the voltage does not look anything like a constant, it's sort of going all over the place, the entire 48 hours, it is within the range of what's considered normal. So there's no problem here, despite the fact that the graph is all wiggly. What's cool, though, is the X1200 had no trouble at all. It uh, didn't turn off, didn't have any errors, so you should have no trouble running long-running loads that are critical in UPS mode with this device. In addition to the X1200 solar generator, Montech has also sent their SP400 portable solar panel for me to test. So, of course, we're going to test it. First off, let's take a look at the manual and the specs in the manual. It says this is a 400 watt rated panel. The output voltage, 39.5 uh, volts, that would be volts at max power. And the open circuit voltage is 48 volts, plus or minus 5%. Let's see how that tests out. So we're at my local park. Uh, it is roughly noon. It is a Saturday in November, so we're not talking the best solar conditions, but we're actually going to test the solar conditions as well before we test the panel to show you where we're at. I have here a solar iridescence meter, sort of pointing toward the sun. 1,000 watts per meter squared is what they call standard test conditions. You can see we are slightly over 1,000 watts per meter squared. So this is an excellent time to do this particular test. And before we plug this into a solar generator to test, let's actually try it out on a meter. So here I have the 1600 watt version, by the way, of this particular meter. And this is a reading that I took earlier. Let's go ahead and take a live reading on camera. And there we go, exactly the same. 7.7 .7 amps and 288.2 watts out of a 400 watt panel. Probably because we're not under full sun conditions, even though the brightness meter is showing full brightness. Next, let's do the series and parallel test, where we're going to cover up one of the panels with a blanket in this case to occlude it as if there was shade on that panel. So first off, we're going to start pretty easy. I'm coming over here, and we'll just put it sort of across the very edge of the furthest panel. And our amperage drops from 7 amps all the way down to 4 amps. So these panels are definitely wired in series. We've got about 50% of our panel covered with a blanket now. Let's do another reading. And interestingly, it looks like we're still at 4 amps. 
even with full half the panels covered. So my guess is that if you cover any portion of one of these four collector areas, that that collector area itself, the whole area is down. And the two areas, it looks like the right half and the left half seem to be in series with each other because covering any portion of the right half or the left half seems to take down that whole half. So what we're gonna do next is cover up the two center panels to confirm that. All right, now I have the two center panels partially occluded. Let's take a reading there. And my amperage has turned to effectively nothing, 0.23 amps. So this tells me we know how these panels are wired. The two panels on the right side are wired together in series. The two panels on the left side are wired together in series. And the right side and the left side are wired together in parallel which means if you cover some portion of the panel on the right and some portion of the panel on the left, you get absolutely no power out of it. If you cover part of one of the panels on the right or the left side, you lose 50%. And next we're gonna hook this up to the X1200 and we're gonna get a five minute time lapse of how much power we're actually pulling out of the panel into the real solar generator. The solar controller in the Montec is able to pull the full power from the solar panel that is available under the current solar conditions. And by the way, the video we're looking at has been sped up by a factor of 20, so we don't have to spend a full five minutes here watching the test. We are back from testing the solar panel out in the park, and the X1200 has gotten all dirty, so we're of course going to wash it off with a hose. Uh, I will call out the X1200 has not been decided yet as to what the waterproof rating is going to be. Uh, so I can't say that. I also can say that the prototype unit hasn't been officially IP rated because the production models haven't been IP rated also. However, the manufacturer did request that I do a waterproofing test, and we're going to do this test with the little doors closed, which I'll show you why later. But it's all dirty, so we're going to hose it off. Washing our electronics here. Gotta make sure we wash all the sides of it. And it is now, of course, soaking, soaking wet. Let's turn it back on, make sure everything works. Yeah, it seems to fire up just fine. Hear the AC inverter relay clicking on, that sounds good. Let's dry it off a little bit, bring it inside and test it. All right, we're back in the lab after the aquatic adventure of washing our electronics. So the unit itself is still turned on and as you may be able to see, there's kind of water all over it still. Uh, we're gonna make sure that it turns on, which it does, and we're gonna turn on the AC inverter. Listen for the relay to click. And it does click on. And uh, then we're gonna open it up, make sure there's no water on the inside by checking the side door. Turn it back off while we do that. Let's open this up. And we have a little bit of water on the outbound side of this seal, but nothing on the inbound side, and the inside is completely dry, which is very nice. Uh, one thing I will call out, whatever waterproof rating this gets, because that hasn't been decided yet, is going to be dependent on this door being closed, at least if the design stays the way it is. Because as of now, there's this nice big thick white seal here going around the edge. That pre pre prevents water ingress. However, if water does get into this hole back here, the circuit board is exposed back there behind the fan. So we definitely don't want water to get in there, so this door will have to be closed, which also means... You're not going to want to leave this out in the rain, solar charging, because despite the fact that it does have a waterproof solar input, this unit, or at least the prototype unit does, needs to have the little doors on both sides opened while solar charging to prevent it from overheating. And as soon as the little doors open, the water can get in. So it's much more of a water resistance during transport 
as opposed to, or if you just leave it sitting outside your tent while you're camping. Uh, much more of that kind of water resistance as opposed to a you're going to be able to use it while it's getting wet rating. Next up, let's test and make sure it still works because this thing is soaking wet. I've got my little electric heater here. Plug this in. Turn on the AC inverter. Inverter clicks in, turn on the heater. Seems to work. Very nice. So we've taken a close look at the Montec X1200 as well as the giant solar panel. So uh, what do I think of it? Um, for what it is, and that is an unfinished prototype, it works very well. Um, we went through all the different ports and there are a lot of ports on this system and they all worked. Um, they all worked to their advertised specifications. Uh, reasonably good efficiency on all the ports despite it not being a finished device. Um, and really fast solar charging in that it charges at 1200 watts with only a 1280 watt hour battery. So that'll be real nice when we move on to expandability to see how fast it'll charge with attached batteries to it. Um, and of course it is unfinished. Um, what I mean by that is you guys saw the app isn't ready yet. Um, there will be a mobile app, but uh, we have part of a mobile app that we looked at, but it's, it's not quite there yet. Uh, the other thing that's definitely not there yet is the sound level control. Um, it, it's, it's far too noisy, um, but they're, they're going to fix that, um, or at least they tell me they're going to fix that uh, for the final version. Um, so is it ready? No, it's, it's not ready. But it's a really, really good start, and it's a really good candidate for the beginnings of what could be an amazing device. Uh, the device itself is being sold by a Indiegogo campaign. The uh, link to that campaign will be in the description to this video. Uh, I will call out, as always, uh, I am not paid to make these videos. Uh, the link that I'm putting in the description does not have an affiliate code in it. Uh, so I won't be getting any financial kickback from, from the device sales. If, if you click my link or somebody else's link, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't get anything out of it. Uh, I make these videos because I enjoy making them and because they're fun. So as long as I keep having fun making them and as long as you guys keep having fun watching them, I will continue making the videos. Uh, as far as uh, Montex stuff, uh, I hear that they're done fixing the external battery that was shipped with this but was damaged. Uh, and that'll be getting shipped back to me. So expect a second video here talking more focusing on the external, external battery. But that's going to be in a little bit because I need enough time to actually run through the testing before that video comes out. So at least a couple of weeks on that one. But um, that'll be coming up. So thanks all. Have fun.